My Seven Chakras, episode 155. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. The Seven Chakras, swirling vortices of energy, positioned throughout our body from the base of the spine to the crown of the head for thousands of years. This ancient wisdom has been passed on from master to disciple. What are the functions of these energy centers? And could these chakras help you unlock your destiny and find your true purpose? Welcome to My 7 Chakras. And now, your host, Aditya Jai Kumar. What's up my action taking family, AJ here and we are back to the show where we dive deep into the oceans of the ancient world and uncover nuggets of wisdom, wisdom that provides you a completely new perspective on life and allows you to take action because we believe that knowledge is not power, knowledge only becomes power when you act on it. This is the show where we believe that science and spirit go hand in hand and that failure is always the stepping stone to success. Action Tribe, before we begin today's episode, I want to read you a recent 5 star review that we received on iTunes. This is a review from the US. Here it is. This podcast is very special. AJ has a great interview style and cadence with the experts they find, ranging from the known to the very special new healers on the scene. Every podcast brings a fresh insight with the consistencies you need to stay focused on your own positive change. A morning ritual, meditation, and positivity. Keep it coming, AJ. So thanks to Chicago underscore KAS for the review. To leave a review and then have your review read out on air, head on over to my 7 forward slash review. That's my 7 forward slash R-E-V-I-E-W and leave your review. I regularly go through all the reviews and randomly pick the one that inspires me the most to be read out on air. And I really, really appreciate the reviews Action Tribe because it helps us get the word out there and your voice truly matters. So thanks a lot for that. And with that, we are now ready to bring you our featured guest for today, Margie Young. So Margie, are you ready to inspire? Yes, I am. That is amazing. After spending seven years in the Bay Area dancing and teaching dance, Margie began to practice yoga. The union of movement with spirituality picked her curiosity. From the Bay Area, Margie moved to New York City to attend New York University's TISCH, earning her MFA in dance and choreography. For a respite from the fierce dance world, she practiced yoga in the smoky incense of Jiva Mukti, offering her a quiet within the bustle. Over time, it became clear that she was much happier on her thin blue yoga mat that in the mirrored dance studio. She soon discovered Cindy Lee's Om Yoga Center where Iyengar alignment meshed with Vinyasa flow and Buddhist principles and attended a teacher training in 2001. As you probably guessed by now, Margie loves yoga. <laughs> she blends flow yoga with Iyengar alignment and philosophy from ancient times to help us with modern life. So Margie, I've told Action Tribe a bit about you, but take about a minute and tell us a bit more about your story. Oh, it's so fun hearing my story read in your voice. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. And thank you for having me. I'll just go from the current, I think. I So I live now in Oakland, California. I live with a, my seven-year-old and my husband. And uh, yeah, what you said, culminated in I love yoga. It's it's a real passion of mine. It's so important in every way. And I just seen it touch and heal so many people. So I'm, I feel gifted that it's crossed my path and I'm able to offer it. So I, my life is very much immersed with yoga and traveling to teach and teaching and my own practices. And my other passions are being in my kitchen. I just got back from teaching a retreat in Italy and just to come home and make my own lunch is such a, a privilege. And to be able to cook and be creative and I cook with my family. And uh, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Well, that's wonderful. I just have a feeling that this episode is going to be simply phenomenal. But before that, let me ask you this. What is your favorite inspirational quote? And how does that quote play out in your life? It's challenging because I am very inspired by quotes. I could list a thousand quotes right now, but I'm picked this one that really relates into yoga practice. Mm -hmm. And it's by Viktor Frankl, who is an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist who was in the Holocaust and in a concentration camp and an incredible man 
man who was able to use his mind to keep some sense of freedom, even in the midst of, of the worst horror, one of the worst horrors that's ever been. And uh, this is something that he said. It's a little bit heavy, so listen up. <laughs> Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So that really, in a nutshell, is what I think yoga has the potential to do, is that in between stimulus and response, so in between something happening, in between my kids spilling Cheerios on the floor and my response, there's a space. And yoga helps us find this space. And then in that space, instead of moving into my habit of like, ah, why did you spill the Cheerios? And everything in the house gets uh, erupted into chaos. In that space, I can make a choice. He says, in that space is our power to choose our response. So in that gap, in that space, after something happens, I can choose whether to move from, as I said, habit, which might be something angst-ridden, or or I can choose to take a breath, feel my feet on the floor, and choose a response that's more compassionate or appropriate for the moment. So in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And by using our practices, whatever they may be, we can elevate and expand those gaps in between stimulus and response so that we can move through our lives and navigate with more, hopefully more ease, more clarity, more wisdom. So that is truly an amazing quote. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Freedom Action Tribe, no matter what you're going through right now, my question to you is how do you find your space, your own version of space based on the experience that you've had, the practices that you've learned, whether it's yoga or meditation, how do you find your space? And then how do you choose to respond? First thing that I need to do is realize that there is space. So it's, you know, life just tends to grab you. I think of like that old vaudeville character where there's a, a guy dancing and then a cane and it just grabs the guy's neck to pull him off stage and all of a sudden rrr, he gets pulled off stage. Like life just has the capacity to, to take us and thoughtlessly drag us into perhaps dark directions or something that might feel like a tornado. So first you have to realize, you have to be like, whoa, there's potential here. I'm not just yeah. stuck, but there's a potential. I can jump off the hamster wheel for a second. And then my, I would say my top two favorite things to do in this moment, if I actually am skilled enough to catch myself, I take a breath and it can just be one breath even if I don't have time for a big situation, a big practice or something, one breath. And I feel my, if I'm sitting in a chair, my seat, if I'm standing, I feel my feet. I feel the earth beneath me, the earth beneath me can anchor me, the breath can create that space, and then I can intelligently create my response. Wonderful. So you mentioned that you blend flow yoga with Iyengar alignment mm -hmm. and philosophy. So let me start by asking you, what is Iyengar yoga? Iyengar yoga is a system of yoga designed by BKS Iyengar, who was an amazing man. And he came from, he had polio, I think, when he was young, and he really struggled to figure out yoga for himself. So he is is the man responsible for when you walk into a yoga studio and there's blocks and blankets and bolsters and ropes maybe on the wall. He is responsible for yoga props, which helps people who might not be able to do certain poses attain them. And he also was very, very interested in alignment and very precise alignment. So maybe something even as, you know, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, but like feel the inner edge of your uh, fingernail on your middle finger lengthening towards the tip of your finger. Something like very, very, very very precise alignment. And that's mm -hmm. his way. That was his way. And now he has a, a many, many teachers who teach his technique. But his way of drawing attention in was through precise alignment. Every mode of yoga, I'm going to say, pretty much has the same uh, goal, which is to heighten awareness. And Iyengar did it mm. through very extremely precise alignment. And to the point where for me, I decided to blend the flow because it, it's a little bit too rigid for me to teach. I, it's good for me as a person to practice because I tend to be a little bit on the loose side. If I had my way, my practice would be just lying on the ground, maybe putting my legs up the wall. <laughs> so sure. for me to go into a practice that was very uh, sort of diligent and strong and structured was good for who I am. Wonderful. So there you go, Action Tribe. It was designed by BKS Iyengar who had polio when he was young and Margi I never knew that he was the one who started using props so that's something completely new to me thanks a lot for sharing now for someone who's new to this practice they usually tend to think about yoga and associate it with physical poses or asanas but as you mentioned earlier you blend yoga and philosophy so 
Talk to us a bit about the importance of yogic philosophy alongside the practice. Yoga is, it looks very different today than it even looked 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Sure. Very different than it looked 200 years ago. But the yoga of ancient times was about the mind. And it was about the ability to quiet the unnecessary thoughts that fly around our minds all the time. So the yoga poses were designed to make people more comfortable so that they could sit more quietly and begin to quiet the mind and try to figure out what on earth we are supposed to be doing here. <laughs> mm. it was a que- this yoga started as a quest for who am I? What am I doing here? And then the poses came into play to open the body so that people could find more ease. Because just like you and me and everybody today, if you sit down to do a meditation, if you're new to it within two minutes, you're miserable. <laughs> you know, if you, you sort of start to get used to it, but the poses are designed so that we can just sit more quietly. Um, Um, There's all different aspects of philosophy that that come into it. And I also really am interested in the Buddhist philosophy of compassion, being compassionate towards yourself. Uh, These poses are so hard, most of them. And if you go into a warrior two and you are just start berating yourself in your mind that you are terrible at warrior two and the person next to you is so much better and you you can go on a bad sort of trip. So implementing the philosophy of kindness, of settling unnecessary thoughts, of being more present in your body is really the crux of it. And when yoga starts just turning into an exercise class without the philosophy thrown in in some way, and it can be done in a myriad of ways, but without philosophy, it's it's just an exercise class and it's not really yoga. So I love that response. From your intro, I know that for a respite from the fierce dance world, you practice yoga. At a certain point, you discovered the Om Yoga Center where Iyengar alignment messed with vinyasa flow and Buddhist principles as you elaborated just a couple of seconds back. At a later stage, you did teacher trainings. You traveled around the world, which made you curious about relaxation. So you taught restorative yoga. After your son was born, you trained in prenatal yoga. So it seemed like you had a different style of yoga for different phases in your life. Life, isn't it? Well, sort of, but they all, of course, when I was pregnant, it was a certain kind of yoga. And as I get older, I'm 48 now, I sort of do, do the, a little bit of this and that, but I maybe move more slowly as I um, as I get a little bit older. But uh, I've always been interested in relaxation. And as I said, that's kind of my tendency. So that's a, yeah. an easy one for me. And when I first heard about restorative yoga, it was in New York in 2001, I think, or 2002, maybe. And nobody was teaching restorative classes there was no such thing. There was restorative Iyengar, BKS Iyengar also taught restorative and that was he used all those props to teach restorative because restorative is it tends to be a prop heavy practice. But oftentimes in that system, the last week of the month, is all restorative poses. But in general, in most yoga studios, restorative didn't exist. I didn't even really know what it was. And I just heard that Judith Lassiter was going to be teaching a training in San Francisco. And I thought, restorative yoga, I don't know what it is, but I like the sound of it. My family lives in San Francisco. I have somewhere to stay. I'm signing up. <laughs> I'm signing up. And uh, right. it turned out to be, uh, you know, it was very exotic back then. I didn't know what Supta Baddha Konasana is, which is a common now yoga pose where you lie on your back with the soles of your feet together and open your knees. It's a it's a restorative pose. So it was a it was a. Um, a good lesson in uh, really deep relaxation. And then uh, after I did that training, I went back to New York and uh, Cindy, actually Cindy Lee, who I worked for in New York, uh, she took that training with me and we got home and we ordered like 30 blue bolsters and everybody was so excited to come and learn this new technique. So I feel like that was the real lucky thing in my career that I felt like I kind of got to introduce restorative yoga to all of these people back then. Now it's more, much more mainstream. Love that. And then prenatal. Okay, I'm going back to your question. So prenatal, yeah, there was a... I did some prenatal when I was pregnant and, you know, that really, for me, that practice after studying yoga for a long time, it was more about community building and oftentimes prenatal classes, you know, you spend a lot of time going around the room and talking about your aches and pains and fears and (laughs) hopes and dreams. Mm. And so it was really about community. And then I was just curious about it after I had my child. So then I did do that training. I don't teach prenatal these days, but it was after I had, had just had that experience. It was a ripe time for me to be sharing that 
with other pregnant women. Absolutely. So I love the fact that you emphasized on community, which I think is so important and amazing when you go to a studio and when you practice for a couple of weeks or, or months, you sort of see familiar faces mm-hmm. build and develop bonds and then you become a part of that community. And then it's not just about the yoga practice, but it's all about being a part of that vibe, that ecosystem, which is a completely different experience uh, altogether. I used to go a lot to a studio nearby Semper Viva in Vancouver and uh, really loved it. Although these days I do a lot of uh, yoga at home Mm. by watching uh, videos online and I've got a yoga mat in my bedroom. So that's uh, really convenient uh, for me. But out of all your practice, you've practiced so many different styles of yoga. You've been practicing yoga for such a long time. What has been the most difficult yoga pose for you to master? And what did you learn from that experience? How interesting. I like that question. First of all, I'd like to say there's been many poses along the way that I see them and I think, oh, never. I will never do that pose. That is not for me. That is not designed for me. No, 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 no. I don't do this anymore because it's happened so many times that I've gotten a lesson. But these big sort of no. And then all of a sudden, one day I'm doing that pose. (laughs) And I don't even, I didn't even know how I got there. And then you know, then a few months later, it's like, oh, that pose. It's like riding a bicycle. At first, it's like so clunky. And then you learn to do it. And there's kind of some joy in that learning. And then you can do it. And then it's just part of who you are. So there's a few many poses. But another thing I wanted to say that sparked into my attention when you asked that question was that we can do whatever we practice. Just like I said, all those poses that I thought, no, then I can do them because I practiced them a little bit or I learned the, how I learned the steps to get to the destination. Um, and I remember there was this one pose. can't remember what it's called because I still have a little bit of an aversion to it. But it's a pose sure. when you <laughs> when you lie on your belly and I think you get your arm elbows underneath you and you kick your feet up into the air and then you bring your feet up over your head. So you're on your belly. And it to me, it, I, it brings up a lot of fear still about like my neck. I feel like my head might just Whoa. pop off. Anyway, so and the studio that I... I taught at Ohm. Everybody thought that. We were like, oh, that pose, that pose makes us feel this way. That pose makes us nervous. That pose, we had a lot of, you know, talk about that pose, that it was like something that maybe created fear or whatever. And then I went over to Integral Yoga, which was only four or five blocks away from Ohm. And at that studio, I would say like the physical practice was not nearly, nearly as advanced as where I was teaching. However, that pose, everybody in that studio did, no problem. So, <laughs> so it's just like a great example of like, that was just in their vocabulary. That was what they practiced. And we practice something else so we can just do what we practice. And that leads me to sort of the philosophy sprinkle along with the pose. Like if we want to be kinder people, we practice being kinder people. If we want to live with a little bit more ease, we practice, have to find ways to practice living with more ease. Love that. So what really struck me as interesting was when you looked at a pose, a difficult one, firstly, you thought you would never do it. But after a certain point, you found yourself doing that very pose. And then you probably were thinking about other poses. And as you mentioned so rightly, it becomes a part of who you are. Action Tribe, take note of this phrase. It becomes a part of who you are. Are. So Maggie, this really ties beautifully into my next question is, how has the practice of yoga helped you in other areas of your life? I think that I've touched on, on that a little bit, that it really helps me to, having a practice helps me to um, <laughs> find that space in between stimulus and response. I'm just going to go back to that. Like having this practice teaches me that all of a sudden, you know, if I'm in a conversation that makes me nervous, my tendency is to get up and run far maybe even across the world to get away from that conversation. But the practice <laughs> has taught me to sit down, to, to listen, try to listen with open ears and open heart, mm-hmm. stay where I am, stay where I am and listen and take things in and be present to what's happening versus my tendency to escape either physically or mentally, but just try to stick in and a hard yoga poses, like learning those hard yoga poses, like we just taught are such a great training for you know, you're, to, you're encouraged not to jump off your mat when things get hard and go to the bathroom. You're encouraged <laughs> to try or to, you know, I see students sometimes when things get hard, they have a bottle of water and start just chugging water. But I know they're not thirsty. Yeah. I know they're just trying. <laughs> they haven't quite fully figured out how to deal with this tricky situation. But just this staying power that I think that yoga mm-hmm. has really, really helped me with staying in it. And then also there's the piece, you know, I luckily, I feel pretty physically good in my body. Mm-hmm. And I love pranayama, which is 
breathing exercises. So, you know, I just love the physical practice and I think it's helped me just feel better when I'm in the grocery store in everyday life. Now, speaking about across the world, you said across the world, so that came to my mind. Our show is listened to in over 100 countries and while many of our listeners would really want to embark on a practice of yoga, they may or may not have a yoga studio or a center nearby. So, what advice do you have for someone listening to the show somewhere in a different part of the world where yoga is not that popular who might not have a yoga studio? to practice and maybe want to consider practicing at home. Make a little space for yourself is a good idea. And it doesn't have to be bigger than a yoga mat, just any little space. You're not allowed to use the excuse that you don't have space. It can even be outside, it can be <laughs> anywhere. So you create somewhere that feels a, a little bit special. Maybe you light a candle, maybe there's a picture of somebody who you you love, maybe you put a flower, whatever it is that maybe makes your space feel special. That helps me a lot to, um, you know, I, I just, I moved a couple of years ago and it took me a while in my house to figure out where I should practice. And then once I found what the best place for me, it took me a while, but then I it's like, okay, now I feel like there's a, a space where I can do this. Um, and the space can move and then you go and sure. to your friend's house and you still can do your practice. But, um, and then luckily there's so many of uh, things available on the World Wide web. So if you have internet access, that's huge. I actually have some classes on a site called Yoga Anytime, mm -hmm. um, which I can tell you about later. But I have some very simple, actually, classes that are good, geared for beginners. So that would be one place to start. Uh, but there's many options. I really like Yoga Anytime as a good, solid site. Another site is Yoga Glow. If you don't have internet access, set your timer. And I encourage whether or not you have internet access, If you, but if you don't, so you don't have the parameter of watching something to learn, there's also many books you could buy. But you could also just set a timer. Say you're going to stay on, if you have a mat, or if you don't have a mat, you can just be on a carpet, on a towel, stay on the mat for 10 minutes, start by taking eight deep breaths, and then stretch in any way that feels good. You know, yoga was invented by mainly men and they just did it so that they would feel better and you anybody has the power to create their own yoga so you can just make it up it doesn't have to look like any special thing it doesn't have to look like a picture in a magazine you breathe you move you're conscious you're doing yoga love that so action drive you don't have an excuse <laughs> right now firstly make a little space for yourself make it sacred make it safe make it warm maybe add a candle or post a picture so that that's your little space that you go to every single day when you want to perform yoga or if you want to meditate if you have internet access as margie said there are so many uh, videos or tutorials and websites that you can go and access you can also buy a book and if you want to really take action set a timer stay on the mat and just start breathing take eight deep breaths prepare yourself as we're learning today because as they say when the student is ready the teacher will appear and i have to interrupt you for a moment and just that i can tell you are a very incredible yogi yourself because of the way that you listen thanks and listening is a huge part of yoga it's very <laughs> it's very i'm impressed with your with your uh, ability to sort of recap what i said and that's a very yogic skill that you have to be so present that you can spew it back just like that so thank you thanks a lot now let's go back in time how did you first encounter yoga what's the story behind that so i have a dear friend who's still a good friend who i've known her since um we were four and unfortunately when we were about 22 her mother was killed in a very tragic accident and i watched her go through different therapies and different things to try to find some respite from the the pain of that and she found yoga and the and the yoga was it brought up the light in her again so I thought, wow, that whatever that yoga stuff is, how much it's worked for her and it continues to work for her, it, it must be something something special. So I kind of tagged along mm -hmm. one day. She was in a teacher training with Rodney Yee a long time ago and I kind of tagged along mm -hmm. and it was like six o'clock in the morning or even earlier and I got to sit in on teacher training with her and I just was so intrigued and then it was weird. This was the first time ever this happened in my life, but I left that studio and I just wanted a big bowl of greens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just like, I, something about it really transformed me and I understood something about space and health. And then 
I I just was just became aware I was a dancer. So I was definitely aware of physicality. And I became aware of a few yoga classes. They weren't all over the place uh, back then like they are now. So I found this class in San Francisco. I think I was home at the time. And my mom and I went to this class. And the only thing that we remember from this class is that we were the only two people who showed up and we laughed the whole time, which my mom thinks is embarrassing, but I think is kind of wonderful. (laughs) And after I left that class and I just, I had that high that people get when they oftentimes when they first start yoga where I didn't even know what was happening but it felt like a drug I felt so kind of free and excited about life and then I just kept sort of dabbling in it and I was just always intrigued the practice always seemed exotic to me Uh, at the beginning you know I went Mm -hmm. and we did I went to some places that we did some very strange breathing exercises and you know it was challenging for me but I always wanted a little bit more I always wanted to come back so, and I just did, did keep coming back until I eventually, as you said in the intro, I just realized one day, you know, it was interesting being a dancer and it was hard. And I honestly don't think I was the greatest dancer. But uh, then I became a choreographer and I was pretty creative, but I, but it wore me to, to the bone to try to come up with interesting choreography and to be a little bit more uh, creative than the other person mm-hmm. and that sort of competitive nature of dance. Um, and I just, yoga was, always made me so happy. And one day I was, and I also also always was inclined towards teaching. I loved to teach ever since I was a little kid and I had imaginary mm. friends and I would teach them how to do math and different things. <laughs> anyway, so I had teaching and then the then the yoga and I was like, you know, my friend of mine, Karen, she said, you know, why don't you do teacher training? And I just, it was like, yes, of course, that's what I should do. I should do yoga teacher training. So then that all unraveled. Wow, that's a really, really inspiring story. Thanks a lot for sharing with us. Now, you've shared a lot of insights with us today, a lot of advice based on what you've discussed today, based on what we've discussed today. As a homework, if you had to tell one of your students to go out in the world and take one action, what would that one action be? I would go simple and and doable, which is to see something that you don't usually see or acknowledge a human being who you might normally just blow by. Maybe it's your bus driver, you say hello. (laughs) Maybe it's a homeless person. You, instead of tightening and freezing, you just feel open yourself, look in their eyes, maybe say hello, you know, just try to do something very uh, simple that you can do. You could even perhaps do it numerous times every day, but just keep opening awareness and noticing things that you might normally be lost in a daydream and blow by. So Action Drive to access the show notes for this episode, visit our website, my 7 forward slash 155. That's my 7 forward slash 155. No matter what sort of adversity or challenge you might face, you can always believe that with hope it can be conquered and in the end, you will be stronger for it. This is an amazing quote by Brooke Ellison. Action Tribe, as we always learn, everyone goes through adversity at some point in their lives. But difference, the difference between those who evolve and those who aren't able to handle the pressure is the story that they tell themselves. Hope assures you that all is not lost and faith takes you all the way across the finish line. But always remember that you will be stronger after this experience. And since we're talking about challenges, Margie, take us back to a time when you personally faced a major challenge in your life and break it down for us. How did you encounter it? And then what steps did you take to overcome that challenge? Well, I'm picking between two different challenges. I think I'm going to go with 9-11, where uh, my life was kind of swimming uh, when 9-11, 2001 mm-hmm. came about, I had a, you say, a wonderful career teaching yoga, wonderful boyfriend who's still my man, and uh, lots of friends. We rode bikes around New York, and we just had a, this great life, and we lived in downtown Manhattan. And that morning at 9.04, 6, whatever time it was, I was actually still in bed, and I said to my to Michael, I said, that was a bomb. I said, what was that? That was a bomb. And then, you know, he said, go back to sleep. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and, then, and then we mm-hmm. got up, and we, you know, we watched that whole thing unfold. I remember calling my mom and, and telling her to turn on the TV, and she said, you know, the world will never be the same again. And I didn't really realize it in that moment. I was just kind of like, wow, what's going on? This is so weird. This is so weird. And she said, the world will never be the same. And then, you know, it all sort of dawned on me that the world definitely has never been the same. And 
those were some like dark days, but I just read this book called Tribe by Sebastian Younger, and it was about people coming together uh, in times of challenge. And there was a beautiful coming together of New Yorkers that day and in the months and time that after that. So uh, it was just a scramble of strangeness and sadness those days after. And uh, one of my favorite yoga stories is that I studied with one of my beloved teachers named Jenny Capular, and we would go to her house. She lived in a a loft in Soho, also near the World Trade Center site. And uh, so after a few days after, we, we got to her house and you had to cross police barriers and whatnot. And I was so kind of unglued at that time. I thought, how on earth can she teach a yoga class? The world is so messed up. How can we do yoga? So we all kind of scrambled in. We got into our mats. It was all very strange. And she looked at the class and she said, in order to practice yoga, you have to lift your spine and you have to open your heart. And then she taught an absolutely run-of-the-mill normal yoga class as if nothing had happened. She went to, she had us just, she gave a felt little tidbit, lengthen your spine, open your heart. And then she did taught the practice, which she always taught. And like an anchor, that practice just anchored us. So that was the first moment that I felt like, wait, I might be able to have some healing from the trauma of that morning. And then it was just kind of a journey from there to keep practicing, keep finding goodness, keep moving away from unnecessary fears going on in my in my head and just to keep trying mm-hmm. to walk the path towards greater sort of light. Well, thanks a lot for sharing that story, that incident, that memory with us. If you had to tell our listeners or share with our listeners one major life lesson based on what you just shared with us, what would that be? You mean keep on keeping on. <laughs> just if there's something <laughs> that works for you. And, you know, uh, I wanted to say that practice can be defined in many ways. So whatever works for you to find more happiness, more ease, more openness. You can use different words to describe what makes you feel good, really a sense of contentment. It doesn't have to be downward facing dog. It can be a walk with a friend. It can be Mm -hmm. making soup. It can be reading poetry. It can be anything, really, whatever, maybe not anything, but, you know, many paths, you know, picking flowers, smelling good smells, getting a massage, whatever it is that fuels you, do Mm -hmm. it, do it, take care of yourself, take care of you. Well, many of us are inclined to, to turn around and take care of others all the time and run ourselves ragged. But the more that we can take care of ourselves in whatever means, again, in whatever means it is that, that helps you take care of yourself, that's your responsibility so that you can fortify yourself and be strong for others as well. So love that. Thanks a lot for sharing that story and for sharing that major life lesson. I'm going to restate the main points that you shared. Uh, you mentioned that during 9-11, uh, 2001, you had a great career. Everything was perfect. You, know, you had friends, you had your boyfriend. And that morning while you were still in bed, you heard it. You heard the explosion go off and you said that it was a bomb. And you remember calling your mom who told you that the world wouldn't be the same again, which I think is a very strong statement. Based on a book that you read, Tribe, you learn that people have to come together after any challenge, something that sets everyone back because of uh, the challenge that they face individually, just like New Yorkers did. But everyone came together after that major calamity. And during that moment, you, you were going to a yoga class and you asked yourself, things are so bad, how can that person, your friend, ever teach a yoga session, even at this stage? But you learned something really powerful from that very class. Uh, and I think it's really powerful when that person said that all you need to do is lift your spine and open your heart. And I think many of our listeners will realize that no matter what challenge they go through, all they need to do is lift their spine and open their heart and take care of themselves and then take action. So thanks a lot for sharing that story with us. Action Tribe, you may not have found your calling yet. You may currently be in a job that you don't like at all. You may also be in a very unhealthy state, but don't lose faith One of the most powerful tools that is going to help you transform is your imagination. As we are learning today, practices such as meditation, journaling, vision boarding and yoga are really amazing because they help you tap into the power of your imagination. But remember, like any tool, imagination can be extremely powerful or destructive as well. Because as James Davis, the creator of Garfield once said, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present or paint a future so livid that it can entice or terrify all depending on how we conduct ourselves today so remember to conduct yourself today in the most 
amazing way possible that serves you and the people around you. So Maggie, would you say that you're living your life's calling as on today? I am happy to say that I would say yes. <laughs> I am That's really, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. I think I found my life's calling. So just for the benefit of our listeners, once again, what is your life's calling in one statement? My life's calling is doing my practice and sharing it with others. That's a huge part of my calling. My other calling is being um, a mother and a householder mm -hmm. and moving through life <laughs> with as much joy and laughter and, and ease as I can, I can, especially in these times when there's so much confusion and sadness, just to keep pulling myself uh, to happy times is my, is my life's calling and then try to sprinkle that joy, like mm -hmm. spread the seeds as best I can. So Margie, let's dive back into your memories one more time. Was there ever a defining moment, a conversation, a phrase that you came across or an experience that you had that really changed things for you? What comes up for me is something that changed when I had a very sick father. He had uh, Alzheimer's disease and everything felt very confused in my family life. And they were my family, mm -hmm. my brother and my mom and my dad were in San Francisco. I was in New York City. So really my yoga practice that helped me sort of see that I needed to take action. Part of yoga is about uh, t seeing where you need to go and then stepping into it. So uh, my practice, it dawned on me I should be uh, near my father in his final years. So that was pretty transformative to leave New York where I really, I loved living in New York City and uh, I, li I was happy there, but I also recognized that it was kind of maybe time for a change. And so I picked myself up in my two-year-old at the time and, and my partner and we, uh, we moved across the country to, uh, to be here. And then this is a little bit off of the topic of your question, but it sparked my memory. The day after he died, I think the day he died, I was supposed to leave to teach a retreat in Mexico. So I postponed it for only a day because I just wanted to keep going with my with my life. I felt like it, that was fine to do. I just wanted to get back into my practice and my life kind of quickly. I got to Mexico and just like I said about like 9-11, I just felt crazy inside. You know, I just felt very chaotic and sad. And, and I got to, to Mexico and I put out my yoga mat and I put my hands on my yoga mat and I just had this feeling of being so at home on my mat. Mm -hmm. You know, there I was in a random town in Mexico, yet I put my hands on my mat. I remember seeing my hands go onto my mat and that was an anchor for me of I know something and I know that there is some light. I know there's some brightness. I have this practice that I can fall back on. So just to know the, the practice really well. And then when I got, you know, in a tumultuous time, just to put my hands down was really, it was a profound moment. So there you go, Action Tribe. We're coming back to this theme again and again today that yoga allows you to see where you need to go and then it really allows you to take action and with that margie we've arrived at my favorite round the wisdom round which is really a rapid fire round that has four questions So let's begin with the first question. What's the best advice that you've ever received? I saw you wrote this question and um, what came into my head, I thought it's so unoriginal and how wonderful it's unoriginal because this message is rampant. And this really screamed loudly into my head. The best advice I've ever received is to be present, to stay present mm -hmm. <laughs> and to kind of relax into the present moment. So name a personal habit that you'd like to share with our listeners? I have a habit that is oftentimes in yoga, people think habits are bad, but there's good habits as well. And I have a habit that when I can, which is most days, in the afternoon, I take 20 minutes and I lie down on in a restorative pose that might just be mm -hmm. lying down um, on my back on my bed, but in sort of an organized way, not in like a crumpled <laughs> way, but just organized way. I set a timer for 20 minutes. I take some deep breaths and I let my kind of nervous system kind of unravel. And it's very rejuvenating for me. And I know in some modern office buildings these days, offices, they, uh, you know, they give their employees time to take a rest in the middle of the day because you get rejuvenated and you can function at a higher level afterwards. And that's my personal habit that I love. And if you can implement, and if you don't, can't do 20 minutes, but you can do five minutes, you know, whatever it is that you can do. And if you can't lie down, do two minutes at your desk and do t deep breaths. 
Uh, just mm-hmm. some way of pulling out of what you're doing and kind of clearing the slate. The slate. I think of like erasing a, a chalkboard and just relaxing, releasing into either breath or lying down, whatever space you can create for yourselves and ease that you can create. So do you have a morning routine? I actually love to share this because I'm asked this from time to time. Mm-hmm. And I think most people think of yogis as people who wake up early and on, are, are on their mat before the sun comes up. And I used to feel like I wasn't an adequate person in the yoga world since I didn't do that. But I have never had the discipline or desire to wake up early and move around. And I, I like to share this because I really encourage my students, my friends to find their own path. For me, it doesn't work to wake up early and do yoga. It works to wake up, kind of get up slowly out of my bed, have a cup of coffee. Then I have a cup of tea. I talk to my son. I pack his lunch. You know, I I ease into the day slowly. Then once he gets out Mm -hmm. the door, sometimes I need to go teach. Usually I have some time to practice. It might be 15 minutes. You know, I can do that. I can have a 15 minute practice. I'd much rather have an hour, two hours, but if I need to have a short practice, I can do that. So that's my morning ritual. And it varies from day to day, but I don't, and I no longer uh, work very early in the morning. I've had times when I teach privates at seven and eight, but for me now that in this point in my life, I don't want to force anything too much. Actually, I know it's in the rapid fire, but I wanted to say another quote that I really love is um, it's from a Rilke poem. He says, may what I do flow from me like a river, not forcing and no holding back the way it is with children. So in the morning, I don't feel like I need to force myself to get up (laughs) and do something that's so uncomfortable for me. It's just not in my personal nature or rhythm to get up and start doing practices early in the morning. I like to practice at night. Sometimes I practice in the afternoon. I do my 20 minute restorative practice in the afternoon. I sprinkle my practices in different ways. So name an inspiring book that you'd like to recommend for our listeners. Such a huge question. I think I'm going to offer an inspiring teacher and writer, Pema Chodron. I love all of her books. They're my, I fall back on them when I'm feeling a little rocky on my dharma or my spirituality. She is a Buddhist teacher, nun. She's written many books. And uh, I love The Wisdom of No Escape. I also love the title of that book, The Wisdom of No Escape, because here we are in this life and uh, we're not escaping it. So how can we uh, live as well as possible? There's one called The Places That Scare You. Uh, She has many, many books. So I would recommend her. Got it. So Action Tribe, to access today's show notes, visit my 7 chakrascom forward slash 155 because the episode is 155. So all you need to do is go to our website forward slash 155. So Margie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot for sharing your wisdom, your insights, your amazing stories. Before you go, tell us one thing that you are grateful for and also tell us how we can get to know more about you and possibly your website as well. Uh, speaking of the present moment, I'm grateful to meet you. It was nice to uh, be able to to (laughs) chat with you. So here I am, and I'm grateful for that. A myriad of other things. I'm so grateful for my current health and my family and friends and my practice and my work. I could go on, but I'm going to stick with I'm grateful in this moment for having the opportunity to talk to you. And you can find me, your listeners, at my name, the website, margieyoung.com, M-A-R-G-I. Y-O-U-N-G dot com. And then also online, I mentioned earlier, yoga anytime dot com. And uh, if you want to have a free month of yoga classes, you can use the promo code YOUNG, Y-O-U-N-G on the sign out and you have a free month of yoga. And it's not just me. It's many, many really great teachers on that site. So I encourage you to check it out. So there you go, Action Tribe. If you want to learn more and if you want to take your yoga practice to a whole new level and you need to go to margieyoung.com, we'll have the link in the show notes as well. And for people who are far away from a yoga studio, if the yoga is not a really big thing in your country or your surroundings, then if you have the access to the internet and you can go to yoga anytime.com and get a free promo month by using the promo code YOUNG. We'll have this link as well in the show notes. So Margie, thank you so much once again for coming on our show, reminding us about the power of yoga and yoga philosophy and taking us one step closer to a human revolution. Thank you very much. I'm very, very grateful. You are listening to My 7 Chakras. Go to my S-E-V-E-N chakras.com 
Download your free gift, get inspired, and take action. Transform your life today. 